Hello, we are going to talk about how we build better customer insights with tenant visualization using ACI. My name is Jonas Kriegesenson. I'm the lead network automation engineer here at Intelti. I'm uh, 28 years old and I have a master's degree in network and system administration. And I focus mainly on backend and Python. I'm Ingmar Lorentzen. Uh, I'm a senior network automation engineer. I'm 25 years old and I might work with main focus on CI, CD, pipelines, infrastructure as code and Python, but I also write quite a bit of front end code. So Intility is a fully managed technology platform and we have a full end to end responsibility for all our customers. Um, so we're managing everything from their laptops, access points, routers, switches, servers, applications, etc. And all our customers have their own tenant in ACI, uh, but due to our security model, no customer can actually access ACI. Um, so we needed to build something on top of it to, to give them insights in their own tenants. And that's what we're gonna show here today and how we built it. Um, so let's just jump straight into the demo first. So here is selected one of our demo tenants and we can see all its objects. Uh, the bright blue squares are application profiles and we can zoom in on one of them. Um, we'll zoom in on the website application. So here we have the application profile, which describes our application. Uh, the solid arrow points out to its endpoint groups, which is essentially just a group of endpoints or VMs, servers, etc. Um, and on in between the endpoint groups, uh, we have uh, contracts. So in, in between the database CPG and the backend CPG, we can see a contract, and we can also see which way the traffic is allowed to flow. If we click it, we can also see what it opens for. So in this case, the ICMP protocol and the port fourteen forty three. Um, we can also, or some EPGs also needs to talk out of ACI, and for that we can inspect all the EPGs layer three out contracts, uh, and this one has gold. Lastly, we can also look at the VRF inheritance for or all the contracts uh, EPG inherits from its VRF. So by clicking this VRF checkbox, we can see all these contracts coming up. So this uh, EPG can basically reach everything in this entire tenant. Similarly to the VRF contracts, we can also show PG, preferred groups. These open for between more or less everything between two APGs. So here we can see the traffic can flow in both directions. We also have some features just pertaining to the visual visualization. So we can uh, sort of just reset our whole view here. Uh, we can find a specific APG. So EPG, we can search for global. We can go to the backend EPG. It'll automatically zoom in to that EPG. And as we showed a little bit earlier, you can also select uh, application profiles and you can select um, multiple. So let's take uh, these two. Then we get just those and we see all of the relations between these two EPGs, no uh, application profiles. But when we're looking at a limited subset of the data like this, we can't see all of the relations an EPG has. But if we trace the node connections for this EPG, we can see all of the relations this EPG has. So we're not missing out on any critical information pertaining to that specific EPG. So we're gonna start off talking about how we built the backend and the backend is built on the FastAPI framework, which is a fully typed and asynchronous framework for Python. FastAPI has a lot of benefits when it comes to API documentation and data parsing because it's so tightly coupled with a framework called Pydantic. And Pydantic does data validation based on Python type annotations. So if I say uh, VLAN should be an uh, integer, uh, but ACI returns it as a string, uh, Pydantic will automatically um, transform it without me writing any extra code. So as we saw in the presentation or in the demo, we had uh, the VRF object directly on our EPGs. Um, but in ACI, it doesn't. It, the VRF is not a child of the EPG, uh, as we also can see here in the menu. Uh, on the top here, we have the application profiles and uh, underneath uh, as a child, we have the EPGs, um, but the uh, bridge domains and the VRFs are not direct childs of the EPG. So the way this looks is uh, when we do a full subtree query from ACI, we get back something like this. We get the in data with the tenant object and the tenant object has a bunch of children, such as application profiles, bridge domains, VRFs, et cetera. And the EPG is a direct child of the application profile. Um, however, the EPG is not uh, directly linked to the 
bridge domain. So the bridge domain is not a child of DBG. Um, the way it works in ACI is that you have these uh, link objects. Uh, so this link object points to the correct um, bridge domain um, through a, a TDN key, which is a target distinguished name. Uh, so in order to find the bridge domain, we need to find the link first. Um, and the same applies for bridge domains to VRFs. We need to find the link to find the actual VRF. So in order for us to find all the VRF um, that this APG is connected to, we need to loop over all the application profiles, find the APG, um, and then find loop over all the tenant childs again to find the bridge domain, and then find the link to the VRF, and then loop over the tenant childs the third time to find the its actual VRF. So this in code looks as horrible as it sounds since we have to do a lot of nested loops and for a lot of tenants this is very inefficient and slow. Uh, for example, if I had 100 EPGs, I would have to loop over all the tenant children 300 times, um, so this doesn't scale. Um, and the solution to the, this is to use a no scoped query um, where essentially you get back the same objects but in a flat structure. Um, so now we can find all the objects on a top level without the nested children. In code, this looks a little different. So we have here on, we don't need to read all the code, but I'll say the sense of it. Uh, we create our own mappings, um, which we will use later with sensible names, such as CPG to bridge domains or bridge domains to VRFs. And then we loop over all the objects from ACI only once. In the end, we have put all these objects into its correct mappings and we uh, combine them all back together again. And the result is that we have this um, response that I showed in the first slide that we wanted with the VRF directly connected to the EPG. And this is very efficient. So even if we had hundreds of EPGs or contracts or whatever links we want to connect, it's still only going to loop through the ACI response once. So this scales very well. So now that we have this response that we want, we can go back a step and uh, create our APIs. And the way it works in ACI is that we, or in, in the fast API, I'm sorry, uh, is that we define our response models. So I would return a dictionary from my API and I would uh, define my response model, which is a pedantic model. And here I've created my tenant relation response, which has the application profile key, which again is a list of application profiles type annotated here. An application profile is a, has a list of EPGs. And lastly, the EPG object itself. And here we can see the name is a string and the VRF is the optional string. Um, and this, with the fast API, when I put this as a response model, it's going to go through that process uh, automatically. And we also get this nice open API documentation without any extra work. So in open API, we can test our APIs by just clicking try it out. Uh, we also get the um, example responses. Um, so we can see here. And most importantly, we also get the entire um, one-to-one -one, uh, schema reflecting our pedantic models. So here we can see the description for every field, which type they have, etc. And this is where the front end takes over, and we um, will hear about that now. I'm going to talk about some of the technique technologies we chose to use when creating the front end visualization of this project, and how those technologies helped us overcome the main challenges posed. Jonas mentioned how FastAPI automatically generates OpenAPI docs based on the code and the pedantic models defined in the backend. And he also showed how these are visualized in Swagger UI. The OpenAPI schema generated by the backend can also be used for more than docs. Just like we can generate the schema based on the code, we can also generate code based on the schema. OpenAPI generator is the most popular code generator for OpenAPI. We didn't use it in this particular project, but I wanted to mention it quickly because it's a great alternative if you're using other languages or frameworks th than what we did in this project. Open API, API Generator supports a wide array of languages and frameworks, both for generating client-side code and generating server-side code. We ended up using a smaller project built with TypeScript, mainly for convenience, since this can easily be run right in our own project with an NPM command without requiring any extra install, such as Java. One of the great things with an open specification like OpenAPI Initiative is that anyone can take a look at the specification and make a compatible tool like this. 
Since we are writing our code in TypeScript, we need types for all of our objects. By generating our API code based on the OpenAPI schema, we get the types for our API requests and responses without write, having to write any code. And we know the types are correct since they're based on the backend code, the pedantic models, which generated the OpenAPI schema. And if there are any changes during further development, we simply rerun the generation script to get the new models. OpenAPI TypeScript CodeGen also generates functions for all of our API endpoints and their respective methods, meaning we don't have to type out URLs, add query params to strings, anything like that. We simply call the functions that we want with the wanted properties and await it, since it's an async function. And then we get the JSON body back. To supercharge this even further, we combine these generated functions with a great package called React Query created by Tanner Linsley. React Query is a library of React hooks for fetching data from APIs with built-in caching and automatic async updating of data. Let's take a look at an example of what this enables us to do. Here we are looking at an EPG endpoint API, which is paginated, since there can be a lot of endpoints on one EPG, and we can't necessarily show all on screen at the same time. On line six to nine, you can see that we call use query, the use query hook, and we pass it the generated function read EPG endpoints to it. We're technically creating a new function that wraps that function as a function call to send the parameters we want to it. The key parameters to look at here are page size and page. When either of these change, the query FN and query key will change, causing React Query to call the API with the new query parameters. However, if we just call the API with the same parameters, it will use the local cache instead of calling the API reducing the amount of API calls on simple things like windows changing. So then we set the page size based on the breakpoint, which is a window width definition from our company's component library. This whole setup makes things like changing data sets based on window size, like this example, or fetching new data based on, for example, uh, input change, very simple, Enable, enables us to spend more time on other arguably more exciting parts of the code, such as layouting and design rather than writing boilerplate API calls. ELK.js is a JavaScript implementation of the Eclipse layout kernel, which is made by the Eclipse Software Foundation, most famously known for the Eclipse Java IDE. ELK has a wide array of layouting algorithms for placing nodes and edges in a grid. We use ELK.js for the initial layout to hopefully give the user an understandable default layout. For the actual rendering, we use an amazing open source React library for node-based diagrams created by WebKit, a German data visualization company. React Flow also enables the users to drag the layout around, customizing their view and letting them dig deeper into the data set. We customize React Flow in a, a lot, such as implementing our own port moving logic, as this was something Flow didn't have. Here we can see our own implementation with our custom styling and the port positioning logic. When working with these two main libraries, using TypeScript was very helpful. By creating new types that inherited from ELK and flow types, we were able to create our own custom data model that we then sent through ELK, JS, and flow. Here we create a type, ACI node, which inherits from ELK shape and node, which is a flow type. ACI node is then used for AP node and EPG node. This is quite important as we have to do quite a bit of data parsing, which we want to optimize. The visualization runs on web browsers and clients that run the browsers can have pretty poor performance and the data sets can become quite large for complex tenants. One of the data parsing challenges is that from a visualization perspective, we don't really think in ACI contracts. We think in relations since each node is connected to another node with an edge and a contract can define many of these relations through having many providers or many consumers. All right. So when we develop things, we like to have good workflows internally for us as developers. Um, and we do that by using uh, something called pre-commit, which is an open source library. Um, so the open source uh, or pre-commit will run a bunch of different checks on our files when we add them and try to commit them. So if I edit a file, I type git add and git commit, it's going to run my uh, pre-commit hooks and my pre-commit hooks will vary from project to project but mostly it will uh, include black for formatting isort for sorting import statements or flake 8 for ensuring we have doc strings and no leftover print statements 
Um, so when all these checks pass, we can push this commit and uh, create a pull request in Git, um, which will trigger our pipelines and run tests and um, all the CI CD. And when the pull request is approved and we merge it into main, we can then lastly push this new version of our software to, uh, to production or QA using Git tags. And this project here is not open source yet, um, but I've linked to a few uh, other resources from our other open source projects using the same workflow. So over the last few months of building this, we've learned a few things. Um, the first one is to use the right framework for the job. Um, internally on our team, we mostly spent um, time developing in Django. But using Pydantic and uh, Fast API to do all the asynchronous calls, especially for contracts and filters and uh, subjects, is uh, is very nice. Um, the next thing is to learn the API object model with, and play around with the query parameters, um, which you also can find resources on in uh, on the DevNet website. But it can really help you um, do the job in a more efficient way and more specific way, and the queries will be quicker if you play around with them. Um, types are very helpful, both in Python and JavaScript or TypeScript when you're using types. Uh, they have some really nice side effects and they make the code a lot more readable and understandable. And they also help mitigate bugs. Document through code and generate code through that. It's really awesome unless you skip a lot of the boring parts of coding. Premature optimization is <laughs> the root of all evil. Build something quick and then iterate over it later. We had a lot of suboptimal solutions in the back end and front end, and we optimized them when we found the need. After a couple of iterations, we had to make changes to the API due to some misconceptions we had. If we had done any optimization before that, all of it would have been wasted. And try not to get too fancy with the ACI objects because um, you'll end up not representing the true, uh, truth of ACI. So if you try to categorize a contract as an EPG contract or a VRF contract, um, it's not going to scale well whenever uh, your technicians actually do changes in ACI. Uh, so try to stay true to the ACI objects as much as you can. When you're doing a lot of processing in the front end, use web workers. They make they offload the hard work to the background and make the whole browser feeling for your users a lot more fluid and just better. And that's us. Thank you for listening. Hope you found this interesting and uh, good luck with all your code coding projects.